Well, if you were to quiz a large number of Christians on the, the meaning, the, the purpose of the book of Jonah, the majority would be pretty confident about Jonah running away from God and then God sending the fish to, to swallow Jonah and deposit him back on dry land. For, for many, that's where their knowledge, their confidence in the message of Jonah would end. A, a few others might be able to relate that Jonah then did, in fact, go to Nineveh and, and preach as the Lord had called him to, but, but very few would feel prepared or confident to have a conversation about how the book ends. In fact, most Christians have no idea how the book of Jonah ends. So far in the first three chapters of Jonah, it's been an epic drama. God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach to his bitter enemy, uh, uh, this enemy of Jonah's people, the Assyrians. And of course, Jonah has no interest in going. And so he hightails it for the coast and he jumps on board a, a ship heading in the opposite direction. And just when he thinks he's, he's safe, stowed away in the bottom of the ship on his way across the Mediterranean, God intervenes. God causes a great storm to, to rise up. The, the experienced and sea-hardened sailors panicked and, and they quickly realized that this isn't just a storm. This is the wrath of God. And so they call out each to their own false god and nothing seems to be working and they toss the cargo overboard to lighten the ship so that it doesn't break apart. And then they remember the man sleeping down in the bottom of the boat. They wake him from his slumber and they tell him to call out to his God and they, they cast lots to try to figure out which one of them is the subject of this wrath and fury. And of course the lot falls on Jonah. Jonah tells them that the only way to appease the wrath of his God is to toss him overboard. They don't like that answer, and so they try everything else first. They row furiously, trying to, to get back to shore, but they're out of options. And so they do, as Jonah says, they, they throw him overboard, and the storm grows quiet. And those sailors, those, those pagan sailors, turn to the Lord and worship him. Meanwhile, Jonah is as good as dead, drowning in the sea, until God again intervenes and Jonah is swallowed up by a great fish. God saves him. God rescues him from his certain death. And after three days in the fish's belly, commemorated by that psalm of thanksgiving and praise, Jonah is deposited on shore. Where God comes back to the prodigal prophet and once again tells him, go to Nineveh with the message of repentance and impending wrath against sin. And this time Jonah goes, he has no choice but to go. And there's no way he could have been prepared for what happens. His half-hearted sermon results in Nineveh repenting from the greatest to the least. And even the king declares an official fast of repentance and sorrow over the sin of the city. God brings about revival among these cruel and wicked people, and God relented of his wrath and was gracious to the Ninevites. And so if you and I were writing the end of the story, how would we draw it to a profound conclusion? We would simply record that, that Jonah saw what God did, that his heart was softened, that he was moved, and that he went back to Israel rejoicing. Like, like the woman at the well telling everyone what she had seen, what she had experienced. That's, that's what Jonah would have done, certainly. Exalting the name of the Lord. He would have been overjoyed by the fact that the same God who had rescued him from the sea had also rescued Nineveh. Lesson learned, throw a party God is gracious and good. End of story. 
That might be how we would have written the story, but that's not at all what happens. The real ending of Jonah isn't a happy ending. It's not a fairy tale conclusion to this epic drama. Jonah preaches, Nineveh repents, God relents from his wrath and disaster, and in chapter 4 of Jonah, we find the conclusion, or perhaps the non-conclusion, to this story. I'd invite you to stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's word. Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 This is God's word to us. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew you're a gracious God, compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort, and Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die And said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. The Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and then it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? God, may your word convict us of our sin. Bring us to repentance and leave us Resting in your steadfast love alone for hope and life. Lord, may you have mercy on us, on us who are quick to desire grace for us and judgment for others. May you have mercy on us who are narrow-minded in our understanding of your love for all humanity. May you take us captive and enslave our hearts and our minds to your grace and to your mission, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we consider our text for today and how it so abruptly brings to an end the book and the story of the prophet Jonah, I want to give you just a brief overview of what we see as Uh, As Jonah, uh, a person, and in particular about uh, Jonah in his spiritual condition as this book winds to a close. And I think the summary statement is, is this. The book of Jonah closes with Jonah resenting the grace of God, angered by the sovereignty of God, and drowning in his idolatry. Jonah resents the grace of God, is angered by the sovereignty of God, and is drowning in his idolatry. Let's handle these one by one. First, Jonah resents the grace of God. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. He became angry. He prayed, Lord, isn't this what I said? I was still at home. 
This is what I was trying to avoid. I, I knew that you're gracious, that you are compassionate, that you're slow to anger, that you're abounding in love, that you're a God who turns from disaster. Jonah could not in any way make sense of what he was seeing and experiencing. How could one simple act of repentance undo the wickedness that had come to define the Assyrians? How, how, how could God just simply spare this wicked city of judgment, the judgment that they rightfully deserved based on one moment of sorrow and fear and repentance? And here's what's fascinating about Jonah's reaction to God's grace. He's not just confused by it. He's angered by it. He resents it. I knew it. I knew you'd pull something like this. That's, that's the tone as Jonah lashes out against God in prayer. This is exactly what I said would happen before this whole mess started. This is exactly why I tried to run away. The word that's used in verse 1 is, is helpful for us. When our text says that it seemed very wrong... To Jonah, the word might actually be a little more forceful than that. It might be heard more along the lines of this was evil to Jonah. That God had done something evil. It just isn't right. And, and then he quotes Exodus chapter 34. He says, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love. That's how God had described himself to Moses. Here's something I want you to think about today. God's grace can be understood, but not believed and embraced. God's grace can be understood, it can be rationalized, but not believed and embraced. Jonah could quote the words of Moses about God's grace. He knew in his mind all about the grace and the mercy of God. He had obviously memorized this ancient confession, but he didn't believe it. He didn't receive it. He resented it. And just how much does Jonah resent God's grace? Look at verse 3. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. He essentially says, God, if this is the kind of God that you're going to be, if you're going to let horrible people off without any sense of vengeance or judgment, then just, just kill me now. I have no desire to live in a world where that is the way that things work. Getting a sense that Jonah might be a little overdramatic? He, he's willing to abandon his life and his relationship with God, all because God showed grace to people that Jonah hated. It shows you the grip that this hatred had on Jonah's heart and on his life. Jonah has so quickly forgotten the incredible grace that was shown to him. He, he boldly and intentionally disobeyed God and ran the other direction. And God was gracious to him. God rescued him. He was drowning in the Mediterranean Sea and God swooped in and saved him. And the consequence of his sin and now here we are a short time later and Jonah is furious that God won't destroy Nineveh. He's, he's a piece of work, isn't he? But he's just like us. He embraces God's grace for himself but then has no interest in, in those he hates being shown that same grace. Jonah may have viewed himself as a sinner, but he viewed Nineveh's sin as far worse than his own. And this sin of Jonah plagues the church today. We, we've created categories of sin that are acceptable and other categories that are not. We live under a fallacy that there is a certain line of sin that cannot be crossed, and it, and it all has its roots in an unbiblical view of our own sin. Anything that we struggle with is in the purview of God's grace. But anything that we don't understand, anything that we don't personally struggle with, anything that we can twist to make other people look bad and make us look 
better. Those things are out of bounds. They can't be forgiven, at least not without proper punishment. How quick we are to forget the grace that's been shown to us. How quickly do we resort back to an understanding of the Christian faith that exists for us, for our purposes to make us happy, to make us comfortable, to make us feel in control? How often do we play the the game of moral comparison, trying to prove that we are better than someone else? It's possible to understand God's grace, but not really believe it or receive it. Jonah resents the grace of God. Second, we see in our text, Jonah is angered by the sovereignty of God. Now, let's define what we mean by that. It's kind of a big, big word. Sovereignty means supreme power and authority. The one who is sovereign calls the shots. They have the right to do what they want, when they want. And so Jonah is angered by the sovereignty of God. This idea is illustrated by the little uh, plant and worm object lesson that God gives us as Jonah leaves the city. Jonah finds a place to sit down and he makes a little shelter for himself. It's probably just uh, temporary shade, maybe branches and sticks, leaves. Remember, Nineveh is in modern-day Iraq. It's hot. Uh, Today, uh, cities near ancient Nineveh during the month of July Average, the average daily temperature is 110 degrees. It's really uh, hot. So Jonah builds uh, this little shelter. And he's sitting there looking back over the city. But why? Verse 5 tells us. It says he was watching to see what would happen to the city. After all, God had promised to bring destruction. God had said it. So Jonah pulls up a chair and he's waiting and he's watching, hoping that God would send fire on this city, would destroy these wicked people. So while he's sitting there, God sends a plant to grow. And it gives Jonah some shade. The plant is is likely a, a, a castor bean plant. It grows 10 feet tall, big leaves to provide some nice shade. Now put yourself in Jonah's place. He's starting to think, hey, finally, something's going my way. God must be happy with me now. God must see these Ninevites for who they really are. He's going to destroy them. Jonah's thinking in his mind, this is going to be a good show. But instead, at dawn the next day, God sends a worm. And that worm attacks the plant and it shrivels up and dies in the heat. And then he sends a brutal east wind, and the sun is intense, and and Jonah again cries out, kill me now. It's better if I die than than live. Jonah is angry because God has, has chosen to take away what God had just freely given. Listen to these words. Uh, up on the screen, there's going to be a, a slide that'll, that'll uh, show us the words from uh, the explanation of Luther's small catechism. This is the explanation of the first article of the Apostles' Creed, and it tells us uh, what what we believe or confesses what we believe about God. Listen to these words. I believe that God has created me and all that exists. He has given to me and still sustains my body and soul, my senses and all my members, my reason and all the powers of my soul. I believe that he gives me food and clothing, home and family, and all material blessings that he daily provides abundantly for all the needs in my life, protects me from all danger, and guards and keeps me from all evil. And then then listen to this part. I believe that he does this because of his fatherly and divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, I should thank, praise, serve, and obey him, this is most certainly true. Jonah doesn't understand this. He is operating with with a sense of entitlement, that, that he should be the one who calls the shots, that he is the one who is the judge of what is fair and right and good. Uh, But look at verse 9 of our text. 
But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? And how does Jonah reply? It is, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. I have to think that God brings this whole plant and worm episode into the story just to prove a point about the condition of Jonah's heart. Not only does he have a flawed understanding of God's grace, but he has no intent, no desire to submit himself to the sovereign control and rule and reign of God. This is a, this is a matter of spiritual maturity, really. It's fascinating when I visit with people who are experiencing trials and crisis in their lives. It's interesting to see how uh, different folks respond to that which is out of their control, but certainly within God's control. Uh, some, with profound faith, come to embrace the reality that they will never know the answer to the question of why, at least on this side of eternity, why we experience the trials and suffering in life. They simply come to echo the words of Job, that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But then there's others who just aren't satisfied with that. They can't get past the why. They're unable to accept the goodness of God and the reality that God does in his sovereignty and in his goodness take away. We get a glimpse of that in Jonah. He, he is angry at God. Angered by both God's grace to Nineveh as well as angered at God's sovereignty. And I think that both of those reactions that we see flow from the third thing that we learn about Jonah in our text. And that's that Jonah is drowning in idolatry. There's so much irony packed into this, four, into this short four-chapter book of Scripture. You remember a couple weeks ago, Jonah is inside the belly of the fish. And do you remember what he says about idolatry? Chapter 2, verse 8, Jonah says this. He says, those who cling to worthless idols, certainly speaking of the pagans, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. That's what Jonah has to say about idolatry. And it's so ironic. Because, of course, the thing that Jonah was accusing others of doing is exactly what he is doing. He, he's clinging to worthless idols and turning away from God's love for him. You, you see, Jonah had made a god out of his political and national comfort. He, he knew that Assyria was the greatest enemy facing Israel. And he knew that they were brutal people, and so he loved the idea of God's wrath being poured out on Nineveh. The, the, the thought of God, who most certainly loved Israel more, granting forgiveness and grace to the Assyrians was almost unthinkable. It didn't make sense in Jonah's mind. When Nineveh repented of their sin and Turn to the Lord. That was, that was a threat to Israel's national safety, national security. And think about this. What, what would happen when Jonah got home and he had to answer to everybody? He had to explain to everyone what had happened. He'd have to face his fellow Israelites who also hated the Ninevites. And he'd have to tell them that their bitter enemies repented because of his preaching. Nineveh's revival was bad for Jonah, bad for Israel, because they were far more interested in politics than they were in the kingdom of God. Jonah valued the success and flourishing of the nation of Israel more than he valued God's saving work in the world. Jonah's identity was more deeply rooted, more wrapped up in his Israeli nationalism than it was in his relationship with God, who is Lord of all. Jonah's racial and ethnic pride and sense of superiority would not allow him 
to rejoice over the salvation of an entire city. Let that, let that sink in. That his ethnic pride and racial superiority would not allow him to rejoice over the salvation of Nineveh. Jonah had made an idol out of his nation, out of his comfort, out of his sense of control. What is idolatry? It isn't necessarily bowing down to a carved image. It isn't just fashioning a golden calf. It's giving anything other than the one true God, the place of authority in our lives. It's allowing anything else to establish our identity, to determine our priorities, to shape our hearts. It's finding our, our joy and our meaning and our hope any place other than in the Lord. Or, or as Jesus would say, idolatry is not loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jonah had made an idol out of his nation, out of his comfort, out of his control. And the result was that he was wholly unconcerned about the things that God was concerned with. He was actually cheering for the destruction of fellow human beings. How prophetic, how powerful is the message of Jonah even thousands of years later? Our love for anything can become poisonous and idolatrous, even good things. It's good that Jonah loved the people of Israel and he loved the nation of Israel. That's, that's, a, that's a good thing. But our love of anything can become poisonous and idolatrous, even those good things. This is so important for us to, to understand that even good things quickly become Idols. In fact, good things are probably the most dangerous things because we justify worshiping them because it's socially acceptable to worship good things. Our, our inner lawyer continually argues for all the reasons that we should worship this good thing. Notice verse 10 and following. But the Lord said, you have been concerned or you have had pity over this plant. Though you did not tend it, you did not make it grow, it sprang up overnight and then it died overnight. And it, should not I have concern, should not I pity this great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. The word concern here, can actually, it could actually be translated as Weeping. Think about what God says to Jonah in that sense. You have been weeping over this plant, which none of us are surprised by when we've read Jonah. You've been weeping over this plant. Should not I weep for the great city of Nineveh? Even the cattle of this city are more important than this plant that has you all worked up. How powerful does this little object lesson with the plant become? The plant sprang up overnight, and now you're all worked up about it. You're angry because it withered. Don't, don't I have the right to be angry, to, or to be worked up, to, to, to weep over a city of 120,000 people who are lost in their sin? Don't I have the right to be concerned about these people and even the animals that I've created? Jonah's idolatry was so deep that he was angry about a plant shriveling and meanwhile wishing for cheering for the destruction of an entire city of people whom God had created and my fear is that the same is true for many of us that we might be so infatuated with whatever has sprung up overnight that we might become so fixated on whatever is giving us a sense of comfort today that we're perfectly fine with Nineveh perishing. Is it possible that Jonah's experience with the plant and the worm is a, is a mini parable that perfectly explains 
American Christianity today. We're, we're so busy being infuriated over whatever political or cultural crisis sprang up last night. We have no pity, no compassion, no weeping, no concern for the modern Nineveh in which God has placed us. The book of Jonah ends not with the triumphant uh, redemption of Jonah. The book ends not highlighting Jonah's personal transformation and, and heart change. Instead, it ends with his utter and complete collapse. It closes not with resolution, but in the midst of an argument between Jonah and the Lord. In fact, the final verse is a rebuke from God. It's as if the concluding seconds of the movie consist of the camera zooming in tight on the main character, Jonah. Showing, making clear how miserable, how resentful, how bitter he is. And then end of movie, roll the credits. No resolution. But I think that's the point. Jonah ends with a question from God. Maybe one clear question, one explicit question, and one implied question. First, the clear question. Shouldn't I have concern? Shouldn't I weep for Nineveh? God says, shouldn't I be concerned? Shouldn't I be weeping over a lost city? Shouldn't I lose sleep at night over those who are created in my image but are currently dead in their sin? But then there's an implied question, a question that lives under the surface. And I'm convinced that this is the, the profound purpose of Jonah's abrupt en ending. And that question is this, do I care? Do I care about the lost? Or am I too distracted and angry? Is my life marked by concern for the perishing or anger over the plant that I didn't plant in the first place. I've said from the beginning of this series that we are Jonah. And so that forces the question, and, and some of you might be wrestling with this now, did Jonah ever get it? Did Jonah ever come to his senses like the prodigal son? Did he ever turn away from his idols and, and turn back to the Lord? And the most direct answer is we don't know. We don't know. There is one bit of church history that might give us some, some insight, and that's the, the historical understanding that Jonah himself wrote this book. Assuming that's true, think about how profound it is for the way that he portrays himself. Rebellious, disobedient, arguing with God, racist, idolatrous. We are Jonah. Called by God into the mission, but full of excuses, full of arguments for for why we're not going to follow. And just like Jonah, God is calling us to repentance, both in a corporate sense as American Christians and in a personal sense as individuals. He's, he's calling us to repent for not loving our neighbor, for choosing comfort and control over his mission. He's calling us to repent for our spiritual pride, for the, the many idols that captivate our hearts, and, and the good news today is that God hears our prayer of repentance. Whether it's the half-hearted prayer of, of Jonah repenting in the belly of the fish, whether it's the, the repentance of Nineveh over their wickedness, God hears and God responds and God saves. As Jonah himself says, God, salvation belongs to, to, to God alone. Salvation belongs to the Lord. My prayer is that we would be people who follow the Lord willingly into his mission. Right here in southwest North Dakota. Surrounded by people who don't know their right hands from their left. May we 
follow the Lord into his mission. May we respond like Nineveh, not like Jonah. Repentance. And may God use us to proclaim that message where he has placed us. Let's pray. God, we so often turn good things into idols. We're distracted from your mission by the things that grow up overnight. We're more prone to hate our enemy than to love them and to long for their salvation. We are doubters and sometimes even resenters of your grace. We place our love for country, our love for ethnicity, our love for tribe, our love for politics, our love for comfort, our love for control over our love for you. We repent. Lord, above all, we're so good at trying to justify what we do. We're so good at explaining away our idolatry and our rebellion, even in religious language. Lord, we repent. We turn from our sin and we ask you to make us part of your mission. We ask you to send us. You, you've placed around us so many who need to know the love of Jesus for them. And so we repent of our selfish idolatry and we turn to you and we ask you to, to change our hearts, to fill our hearts with love for neighbor and for enemy. So Lord, send us, use us for your glory that Nineveh might know of your great love in sending your son to die for them. And it's in the name of that son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.